This PowerPoint is on different ways to display data. If you look below at the data set, you can tell that it contains several members. The data set is not organized in any fashion. It's not in order from least to greatest, nor are the numbers grouped due to consistencies or differences. For data to be the most useful, it needs to be organized. One way of organizing data is a stem and leaf plot. In a stem and leaf plot, we take each number in our data set and separate it out. Typically, under the leaf side is the ones digits, and under the stem side on the left of the vertical line is the tens digit. In this stem and leaf plot, our stems are 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. That means our numbers go from the 20s through the 60s. And if you notice, for example, where the stem 5 is located, and the 7s to the right of the line, that represents 57. The last number on the leaf side to the right of 5 is 9, and that would represent 59. Welcome to My Secret Math Tutor. In this example, we are going to make a stem and leaf plot. Now, these are great plots. They, they give us an idea about the distribution of our data, but they can be a little tricky to make. The idea with making a stem and leaf plot is we are going to identify the leading values in all of these numbers, and that will become our stem. And then with the other values in the number, those will become the leaves. All right, so let's see how this works out by first creating the stems. So I look at all the numbers in my leading values, and it looks like I have a 2, a 5, some 6s, 7s, and 8s. So it looks like my data goes between the 20s all the way up to 80s. So I'm going to use 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. And these are my stems. I'm going to pit, put a big vertical line to separate these out from the leaves. Here's where I start to collect all the other numbers. So if I have a 23, let's put the 3 there. When I get to this 3, well, I don't have any 30s, so I'm going to leave that one blank. No 40s, leave the 40 blank. Here's a 58, so let's go ahead and put an 8 next to that 5. And now we get into these 60s, and we got lots of 60s. In fact, I have two 62s, so I'm going to put a 2, and then I'm going to put another 2. So the way I read this is, here's one 62, and here's another 62. Let's keep going. So it looks like I also have a 63, a 65, and a 67. So 3, 5, and 7. All of these are my 60s. All right, we're on a roll. So let's finish off these 70s. I got a 71, 71, and a 72. So 1, 1, and 2. And looks like I have some 80s. An 80, 82, 82, 82. Now, with the 80, make sure you go ahead and you put in a 0. You don't want to leave it blank, because the blank means that you don't have any of those particular uh, data points. But we do have an 80, so put the 0. Then a couple of 82s. Oh, it looks like another 82. One, two, three of them. So again, these numbers represent the leaves. So the way we read this is we recognize that this is our leading term, so 5, and there's our uh, trailing term, so this would be a 58. You know, that number would be a 65. And we can see that many of our numbers are in, say, the 60s and 70s. So again, it gives us a great idea about the distribution of our numbers. And there you have it. If you'd like to see some more videos, please visit MySecretMathTutor.com. Another way to organize data is in a histogram. A histogram looks very similar to graphs that we've made, known as bar graphs, before in class. But you'll notice there's a few changes. First, if you look at the x-axis, where the miles per gallon are shown, you'll notice that the number increments are given in a range. For example, the first blue bar represents any miles per gallon rate of 5 to 10 miles. 
The second bar shown, the green one, shows a range of 10 to 15 miles per gallon. The third one, 15 to 20 miles per gallon, and so on. You also will notice that on a histogram, the bars fill up the whole space and they touch one another. Now it's time for your table to practice. You'll have three minutes to answer the questions on the left side of this slide using the histogram located on the right half of the slide. Good luck. If you need help, you can ask someone at your table. Okay, you should be finishing up. A lot of you caught on that number three asked for the title, and this histogram does not have a title. So for number three, write in what you think a good title would be for this histogram. Okay, now we'll move on. Another way to organize data other than a stem and leaf plot or a histogram is known as a box plot. A box plot, if you notice in the picture below, is consistent of all the data that's in the data set, but it points out or marks out for us five main pieces of data. Three of these pieces we already know how to find from when we analyze data using the measures of central tendency. The two new ones are the Q1 and Q3, sometimes referred to as the lower and upper quartile. The minimum, which we use to find the range, is just the smallest number. The maximum is our largest piece of data, which we also use to find the range. Then right in the middle is our median, and it's marked with a dot and a vertical line, and it is the calculated the exact same way we did when we used the measures of central tendency, mean, median, mode, and range, on the data set in the previous lesson. To make a box plot, you have to identify those five key parts. And once you do that, your diam uh, parameters of the box plot, also known as a box and whisker plot, are set. So the first thing you need to do is find the lowest value of the data set. That's our minimum. Second, we find the largest value of the data set. That's the maximum. 
Thirdly, we find the median of our data set, and that tells us where the middle is. And we put a dot on that and draw a vertical line through it. The way we finish up our box plot or box and whisker plot is to find the Q1 or lower quartile and the Q3 in the upper quartile. This is pretty easy to do once you get the hang of it. If you can find a median, you can find the lower and upper quartile. What we do is we look at our data set. We look at the minimum value or the smallest number in the median. And we find the middle point of the lower half of the data. So what's halfway between the minimum and the median? That's your Q1 or lower quartile. You repeat the same process to find the upper quartile or the Q3. We look at the median and the maximum or largest value, and we find the halfway point between the two. This is our upper quartile or Q3. Now, tomorrow in class, we'll be finishing up going over the three ways we talked about displaying data today. We'll do some examples together, and then you'll do some constructing of these displays of data on your own. This is a list of the resources used in my presentation.